what you have done in the Parliament, uh, I would not uh, hesitate to define historical. And I start, uh, as you said, uh, with the PPP history. PPP during 2001-2004, I was the PPP coordinator for the enlargement. You know, the union had to enlarge, and there was not enough money. Oh, this is a recurrent problem, that there is not enough money. So with the EIB, the EBRD, and other actors, we started this blending. We didn't call blending at that time. You are right. We invented it later, the, the word. But de facto was a way to combine loans, equity investments from private people together with public money, taxpayers. And that was very effective. We had a problem, though, in public-private partnership when you enter into a concession agreement and you inject with public money, your thinking is, okay, where is the benefit that must go of this public money in the public-private partnership? To the public side, to the private side, both? To the citizens? You know, the answer at the end was the final users, the citizens. That's where the benefit ultimate must go. And that's the very key of this blending. But in 2007, we started in the external cooperation, the first blending facilities. The first one, indeed, uh, uh, was organized together with the European Investment Bank, was the Africa Infrastructure Trust Fund, which I chaired for the last three years. And we take decisions there on investments, productive investments, infrastructures, but we need also to expand the, the range of investments, not only for public or public-private, but indeed for totally private investments. So it's not a, any more public-private partnership, but it's private intervention, massive intervention, into the economy. I listened to the interesting panel before. You were talking about uh, migration. Okay, tell me which wall will contain 80 million people pushing it. Because that's what we are talking about. 2050, we will have between 50 and 100 million people moving, pushing. There will be no wall. You can ask any engineer. There will be no wall to resist that push. So you, we need to create wealth. And indeed, wealth is not created by bureaucrats or by politicians. We can enable, we can assist, we can create policies. But indeed, is a private entrepreneur risking risking, because without a risk there is no private entrepreneur in our view, risking and then assisted to go and to risk in regions, in sectors where today is too much risky to go. That's the key point, the additionality of the public intervention. We don't need to support somebody going to invest in a place because it's already going it. So you don't need a public subsidy, you don't need to create a distortion in the market, but when the market doesn't work, when the market fails, and I can give you plenty of examples, I was ambassador in Africa as well as in Pacific, when the market doesn't work, when the market fails, then you need the public hands to, to play. Honestly, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know, nobody knows what would have happened without the billions of uh, public spending in development in the last 40, 50 years. We don't have a, uh, a test case to know. Yes, it didn't work as we expected. Yes, there are still many countries in trouble. Many others are much better be today than they were before. And some of them also because due to ODA. So I wouldn't put every everything in the garbage. But yes, we are not happy. And that's where we moved progressively in to get these new players, and especially those making productive investments. The problem is the risk. The equation is to how to hedge the risk in order for a private investor to go and create jobs where today it doesn't go. And that is a, a statement that applies to very, very many countries in Africa today as elsewhere. In 2014, the European Commission launched a communication on the role of the private sector in development. Before that uh, year, we didn't know, we, we couldn't instruct uh, functionaires uh, of the European Commission on, on how to interact with the private sector without a tender, without a public call. Now we have a, 
way to interact. And that's very important. Because if we don't have the policy coverage, we are not able to craft technocratic solutions. Now, 2014, and I would applaud again to uh, Honorable Deva, because he, in the Parliament, in the discussion, he supported that move. And that was not an easy discussion. Still, 2015, still not an easy discussion. Still not everybody is on board. Eh? And of course, there are situations where ODA is irreplaceable. You can't replace ODA for emergency. You can't replace um, um, situation of fragility or situation of resilience or food insecurity with private sector. No, 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 no. So ODA is precious. And that's why where it's not strictly necessary, we should use other flows, private investments. So we have to be able to do this uh, uh, shift in the paradigm of development cooperation. What I define development cooperation 2.0. We have to move into that, and uh, the Parliament will be asked, uh, as per the 14th of September, the European Parliament, to discuss a regulation of the Commission that we are drafting. And that regulation aims to, to build this European external investment plan, which is, uh, comprises the blending facilities on public infrastructure, but also a very innovative product which is a guarantee for private investors. A guarantee, first loss guarantee. And that is what was a missing piece today. Of course, there will be transparency rules on how to uh, give this guarantee. There will be uh, banks like the EAB, but not only. We need all the actors. The EAB is a special partner for the European Union, of course, it's the EU bank. And we need also others, KFW, uh, Cassa Depositi e Prestiti in Italy, Agent Francaise pour le Développement. These are fundamental actors uh, in Africa, as sometimes they have more offices than we do. The difference, I would uh, uh, remark, with, between the FC, the European uh, Fund for Strategic Investments, and this external investment, is that it's much more complicated outside the European Union is not simply a banking activity. It's mixing of policy action, political judgment, as well as bank, banking expertise. So the blending of all that is not only a blending of money, but it's a blending of skills, of people, of competences, is indeed what our President Juncker will present to the Parliament, to the Council on the 14th of September, and on which I can't, I can't elaborate too much, otherwise I will be fired. But it is a very, very innovative. On the, on the, on the map, on the road that uh, Nirj mentioned, pushing, pushing more the private sector into it. Later on, maybe I can complement these few comments, but I would uh, like to, uh, to say that uh, indeed 2001 PPPs for enlargement, 2007 the first blending facilities, 2014 the the policy on how to involve the private sector in development, and now 2016, the external European investment plan, a sort of Marshall plan for Africa that will make the trick. In the past, you heard many, many times, oh, the Marshall plan will not work in developing countries. Why? Because there is not the necessary leadership. Now, this is no longer true. Now we do have the leadership, we do have very educated uh, uh, people in, in developing countries, they have more masters and PhD than you and me, and therefore now there is the conditions to, of course, countries are different, Africa is not a monolithic situation, eh? there are 55 countries, but starting from those that are readier, going to the others, this is the task to do. This is indeed, and I'm sure G7 next year will take that path that European Union for once is leading. Thank you.